If I could paint, I'd consider the canvas a door. If I could paint, I'd consider the canvas a door. The image would be completely flat. Color would be subtle, light browns and yellows. The door's handle would be broken. A, a screwdriver would hang from a cord. When I grabbed for the door handle, it would fall and shatter. If I pressed my eye to the keyhole, I would be surprised to discover an orchestra. The conductor is not Marcel Duchamp, but Piranesi, the Italian obsessed with ruins. Piranesi is asking the third violin to play with feeling on the third when the shopkeeper discovers his sister has been beaten by the third grade teacher. At this point, I pull my eye from the keyhole and eliminate the screwdriver, the teacher, Piranesi, and the orchestra. What remains is a door. Every wall has a story to tell. Every wall has a story to tell. These walls are thin to any conversation. Pressing up against them, I can witness Venice in Thomas Mann's time, the Cupid shooting an arrow, the discretion of a turn of the century era before Cubism became passe and, and Duchamp was still a toddler in short pants. As I said, every wall's a good conversationalist. Every wall deserves a back rub. Every wall loves an occasional paint job or the plugging of its holes. These walls are culpable. These walls are guilty. These walls are ashamed. They are easily bruised by marbles, windows, posters of women wearing more makeup than clothing. These walls stick their tongue out. These walls are, are naughty. Sometimes I sit staring at their pockmarked surface, imagining India, Beijing, Constantinople. These walls enclose Muslims in prayer, incense rising, the odor of camels. Bedouin smoking from a hookah. These walls remind me of the sanctuary in Florence where Fra Angelico painted angels till he was blinded by their light. These walls point me off on a mission, tie my shoes, tighten my tie, shoo me off like I'm about to begin a long adventure as an apprentice to a magician, becoming adept at pulling rabbits from air or cutting blonde dressed damsels into thirds. These walls surround me with their lying, their mooing, their yodeling. And when I close my eyes, I'm mountain climbing in Grindelwald, and there's no wall I won't stretch my frame over. Sit with this wall, pet it, caress it, adore it, say, good wall, invite it in for the night. Last night I couldn't see straight. Last night I couldn't see straight. Everything was crooked, angled, upturned, out of sorts. The world was woozy, hazy, muffled, like a deep fog covering everything in mist or a smoke machine gone gafui. Nothing was parallel, aligned, rational. I looked across the field and discovered iron fences, barbed wire cables, indestructible magnetic forces. The outlines of my hands and arms faded in and out like a white line on the highway. I asked God for an explanation and he guffed forth louder than an exploding shell in wartime. My entire body disappeared and I found myself three-dimensional on the coast of a desert island catching fish the size of torpedoes with my bare hands. The waves rose to the size of skyscrapers, 
and I ducked under the fallout of their wake and materialized back in my room, spinning dice and hoping for sevens. Suddenly, everything became sharper than the blade of a guillotine, and I got on my knees and thanked the mystical beings of the universe for bringing clarity back into my life, and peace once again reigned among the tiny and large fishes of the sea. Transparent poem. A glass, transparent, reflective, smudged by fingerprints and lipstick. A glass, cool as ice, shy around curious fingers, assertive around loose grips, casual repartee, academics analyzing its chemistry. The glass smashing a forehand at health, at youth, at certainties climbing to the roof, breathing fresh air, inhaling the blossoms of spring. A glass decorated by gazelles, galloping, prancing, circling, strutting into the day, breaking the seal on the ancient spell, laughing at the ludicrousies of history, sipping wine, leaning back, tipping over, shattering, splintering, disintegrating in the churning disposal, becoming zero, nothing, a flickering memory, a vaguely remembered thing, a glass holding the world in its sharp reflection, its stubborn silhouette, its rock hardness against the coming of the light, the coming of the light, a glass sitting, resting, pondering the blue sky, the ever-present sun, the meandering clouds, a glass drunk from, swallowed into the abyss of the stomach, the body's secret rivers, the ebb and flow of time. <laughs> you guys can hear me, I guess, because I'm screaming into this. Yes. In the red mask. Hey, Zora. Oh my God, Rose. Hey, Anne. <laughs> the woman in the red mask. The door opened. She came in wearing a red mask. He died, she said. In my arms, she said. He was barely breathing. The virus suffocated his cells. I held him till his heart stopped. She kept washing her hands over and over, lathering the soap till it was thick as a cloud on a stormy day. Many stormy days ahead, she grimaced. It's like haze down there. Nobody goes home alive. She washed her hands over and over whistling the tune to blowing in the wind. I was home again with her, together but apart, in a din of contagion and the blues. Scrub-a-dub, scrub-a-dub-dub. A few more. Poem for Cezanne. The wine bottle is tilted against the sky and the offbeat rules of Cezanne. The impossible is capricious and the capricious is impossible. The single bicycle wheel turns and the world is going da-da. That was before beauty moved into my house and stayed there. The force of the sun's rays made me blush the stars in the sky exchanged looks. Was I supposed to make love with her under a blanket of suspicion? The birds sometimes mate with bats. They like their dark and heavy looks. The birds chirp like nighthawks, and the bats whistle in three-part harmony. It's a respectable pursuit 
among the easily pleased and the strong arm twisting life into impossible fruit, daring love to upset the apple cart of youth, bartering with truth's ability to ripen everything. Night, 1575. Sometimes at the hour of the wolf, I sit and stare into the abyss of my canvas, so much white in a field of darkness that gestures for me to follow, and I raise my brush like a glass of champagne and celebrate the sounds of the night, which serenade me with their mysterious catcalls. In the other room, a large canvas exchanges blows with the night, edging toward a supernova, illuminating all memories and shimmering for me to follow. At these times, I submit to folly and my brush marches on, painting an upside down world that falls on its face like a clown. And I rush into enthusiasm, taking giant steps galloping across territories of stars, drinking the night into my skin like air, before returning to my chair, before returning to my dreams, before returning to my foolishness in the hands of the mischievous night. And I'll, I'll finish with this in the far, far away. In the far, far away, where demons renounce the devil and dragons cheer for the underdog and long-toothed professors sing the blues, I'll buy you a drink of love, scarlet as a rose, deep as an ancient tar pit, fragrant as a bouquet of gardenias. I'll grab you from the headlines, police sirens enshrouding you in glare, handcuffs snaring your wildest gestures, monkeys mocking your most honest desires, and throw you in a cage, the lock clicking behind you like a siege in Paris on the eve of la Revolution, so you escape the piercing of rifles and the sabers of men on runaway horses, and recite all Shakespeare's sonnets without even a brief break between soaring above the alluvial plain in a painting by Turner, the splash of yellow and red mixing with green, the sun storming across the field like an impatient soldier, the drummer boy tapping a requiem in the distant foray of soldiers dying like pawns in a futile game of chess where every day is a, like a lasso hurled into infinity breaking the rules of Mother Earth, jumping into a cauldron of war and peace, emerging in the light of spring, rising from the earth into the emerald blue skies of the far, far away. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, um, we're going to move right along, and our next reader is Yuko Otomo. I'm going to read her bio, and I love her work so much. And she's a great artist. In case some of you don't know, she's also a wonderful artist. Double threat. A visual artist and bilingual writer of Japanese origin, she writes poetry, haiku, art criticism, and essays. Her publications include Garden, Selected Haiku, B4650 Beehive Press, Small Poems of the Dumpling Press, Study and Other Poems on Art, UDP, Koan, New Feral Press, Frozen Heat Wave, a collaborative linked poem project with Steve Delashinsky, the late great Steve Delashinsky, who's with us right now, I know, and would be here. Luna Bizon Prize, and the most recent, Anonymous Landscape Lithic Press. 
introducing the one, the only, Yuko Tomo. So happy to be here with all our friends. So beautiful. Actually, it was not easy to find any thematic poems because you know, I was just talking to Carl. I'm not good at thematic stuff. So. But I did find some poems about wars, but not borders. So I'm just reading war related poems. The first one is about our kitchen wall, which is dedicated to Steve. It's an old one. Description of our kitchen wall for Steve. Brick by brick, sweat on sweat, nostalgia and dreams, mustard mixed briefly when he rested himself to take his lunch under this wide open sky a long time ago. Let me have a slight distance from our crumbled life. Let me have a breath similar to the one of the brick layer who built this kitchen wall a long time ago. A boy or woman, I cannot tell she is staring at the running water. It is urgent. Her eyes gather all the intensity of existence. It almost stops the rapid flow of the water. She is mute. She is seeing, seeing something very clear. Sky is always there. Spices. You are not there with me, but I heard your voice and I walked with it in the middle of an enormous nowhere. I did not feel lost. Birds swim, a fish fly on this red brick wall. A mirror reflects an image of souls breaking a pine cone to scatter seeds. We sleep, we walk, we eat words, color, line, and form, breakfast and dinner with this wall. Dog with is constantly in bloom. Forage is eternally at its height for seasons. Luck or no luck, does it matter? Dark medieval days, in its darkness, a bell rang. Among Giotto's beatitude, a paper boy stands underneath the displaced Joan of Arc, then follow Cows in a meadow, a flute, a bone, a lute, a clock, a calendar, a pun, a perfect city, a perfect beach, a perfect mountain, a perfect cliff, a perfect trumpeter, a perfect bookstore, an island we live on, an open field. All float for nothing, as you said. All for nothing on this wall. An 
earthen jar filled with pebbles, rocks, feathers, and leaves for nothing. Brick by brick, dust by dust, a painting after painting, a poem after a poem. Do we have to know where we're going? Do we really have to know who we are? That's the poem for seeing about our tenement kitchen window. To go. such 
water. We, hand in hand, place our serious ears against the intimacy of the world. Okay, now I'm reading from uh, one of my, uh, the, the most recent book called Anonymous Landscape. It's a meditation on anonymity in 200 parts. It's a one long poem. And I found part. <laughs> something to do with poem. So I am going to start from 152 to uh, 159. So, but I will say the number. I will give the space between the segments. Anonymous signs, anonymous houses, anonymous inhabitants, anonymous family crests, devils and angels, bleeding hearts and roses. They all cry out in one anonymous voice, saying, help me. heart was stuck by a knife. The world was bright like a red, red umbrella. In the rain, a bird flew away carrying a letter to someone unknown. The day was like a beautiful hat worn by a child. It's 5 a.m. p.m. A man hangs himself, wishing he was a beautiful hat worn by a shy girl with no name. Switch by switch, somebody with a name but known to no one, fills the fabrics of life with an image of warm fish, flowers, weeds, and a woman with anonymous tears. Stitch by stitch, he moves away from reason of any kind. men talking, two animals talking, two men with hats on fighting, two pagan stories told, two notebooks burned, two names disappeared. Rules of the game shared and understood by no one. Faces buried in a cave with no mask on. A banquet held for everyone. A table full of screaming silence beyond fear. It's me, it's me, it's me again, that's me too, here again, it's me, it's me, it's me, it's all me. White masks with no eyes, white masks with no mouth, it's me, it's me again, here it is, it's me again. Like endless faces sitting on a hill. It's all endless variation of anonymous me. Twisted and tied up at random 
for no particular reasons. All the toys are forced to morph themselves into a silent, silenced voice on the wall. The color of the wall is faceless. Now that's 159 goes to 200. And I have a copy if you want to, because Steve told me how to push my march. <laughs>
has to do with that. So I've read five or six books. Thank you for the time on this. Our food in your hands. How can a man walk through a supermarket anywhere in America without feeling the imprint of your hands on everything he touches? Hands strung in the dawn of cinch pub nematodes, smell of dung, plastic buckets, bandanas, and short-handled tools. Hands which dream of bean fields, straw, beds, and barbed wire, corn, silk, and buttermilk. The watery music which leaps like fish out of blue, mestizo night, like your family's laughter and into day. You migrate through South Carolina like drift of fog. You harvest tomatoes in Florida. You migrate through Delaware, Maryland, Connecticut, and Maine. You harvest potatoes, apples, soybeans, peas, beets. You tend to broilers, heifers, and sows. You harvest wild rice. You pick avocados and grapes. You plant white tufts of cloud into the hair of your children like seeds in heaven. Oh, lettuce, oh, bold Salinas Valley, oh, crates of California, plums, apricots, Oregon, cherries, and plastic bags in low country and on the high mountain tops, cucumbers, string beans, Brussels sprouts, walnuts, peaches, almonds, oysters in their shells. Broadcast letters, sprinkler pipes, and burlap sacks. How can any man, woman, or child in Colorado, Alabama, Arkansas, Missouri, Louisiana, Illinois, any man, woman, or child in Cochise County, Arizona, or right here in New York City ever walk through an American supermarket without feeling the power of your hands, balancing every crop and planted field in America against the remaining hours of day. Your back, your neck, your feet, your shoulders, and especially your hands hold families of hands tired, cut, bruised, bug bit, hard with work, under-witnessed, underpaid, ripped off, and oh yeah, ready to be, kicked, to be kicked out because you come back, don't you? You always come back, don't you? You burn through mist like the border sun which migrates through every supermarket in America. That's what I don't know if you've ever seen the Alamo, but you can fit it in this space. Alamo, Alamo, wicked and small. Insignificant as cotton candy. No bigger than a 7-Eleven. But it's big enough. It's situated at the crude corner of capitalism and death. And no excuse for our humanity. Texas poplar, Alamo, Alamo, adobe symbol of a nation that chased away the giants that live in mountains. A nation that spread like snapdragons through sedge and brush and coiled like a snake. A nation stolen, a nation lost, a nation justified by its own self-proclamation of the higher purposes of European gods. Alamo, Alamo, the lost glory of a doomed and precarious age, foisted on the new world like Disney heroes in the blue-blooded mist. Forget the child stolen from her mother's arms. Forget the barbed wire and the practicum of death and domination. Forget the finer points of crime and walls and money and civilization, the DNA modified in factories to burn patriotism into our veins. Forget the soldiers dead or blinded on both sides, the martyrs, the mothers, the lovers, the comrades, the orphan child, the grieving fathers, Alamo, Alamo, victors, vanquished villains, exposed cowards and heroes, all slaughtered, all the young bodies spilling out like the foam of God in a dirty river. And the sign of the cross so open and wide, the sign says open for business. So of course the settlers pour in, armies of traders, scouts and bankers, and soldiers and thieves. No more the bear hunters and Shenandoah gamblers. No more the sunstruck wanderers stripping tendon from bone. No more blood from blood. No more marauders and Jim Bowie blades flashing. The children of the 50s in their coon skin caps are the masters now, the horse soldiers now. Their cop guns blasting, their tenderloin ties, their ten gallon hats. Never mind the nomenclature of nations, Mexico, America, England, 
of Spain. Never mind the empire of the Aztecs ripped like cotton from the copper from the spine of the Andes. All blood spills in the same direction, back to vulture governments and distant capitals. Back to priests and brokers and politicians. And forget the partisans dying in the sun and the solemn-eyed peasants scratching corn from dusty furrows, and the slow-eyed men taking siesta in the unforgiving shade. And there are ghosts of presidents, and there are specters of presidents yet to come, and none shall avail, neither the admirals of the plains, nor the generals draped in their rotten sails and tent poles. It's all dead timber. The apparatus of an empire no longer at their fingertips. And a nation built on murder dies by murder and a nation that loves its guns and thrives on gun dreams is a nation that makes it the job of one to kill many and rocks us into the vicious web of vampire sleep and the sign says open for business so of course we come and the tourists pour in and anyhow it's the alamo and anyhow it's president's day and anyhow, this is America. And anyhow, nobody knows what they're celebrating. Bombs sweat, the death-covered brow, the fireworks going off, the bulldozers rolling, and the wives and children of refugees buried alive, weeping like poplars in the freezing Texas rain. These terrible, ordinary adobe walls, which will one day wash home to the sea from whence they came. I think I can tell you I wrote one, it's going to be a world premiere, but I think we'll take one more time, so I'm going to save it for another. This is a picture in the New York Times of a couple of refugee children from one of the Central American countries. They were just making it to the southern Mexico border, not up to that border. And they're stuck there. And uh, there were three happy children who played kids for a, a commercial, you know, for, uh, for some soft drink. They were just smiling, arms around each other. It looked really beautiful. That's your typical picture of a you know, you can help this poor child or you can turn the page like some stories or something like that. And I was struck by the optimism and the joy and the beauty in their faces that they were the future. Why are the refugee children smiling? The children you cage behind bars and walls and razor wire, they are not afraid of you. In fact, they are smiling. In every refugee camp, in every detention center, you try to hold them in. Even as you count them captive, even as you punish them for your own sins, even as you parade them before cameras and lash them with the tongues of your ministers of hate, they see through your weakness. They see through your fear. They see through your crudeness and cruelty and the futility of your old world scapegoat ideologies. In fact, they see through your walls. What did they see? They see a future without you in it. And that's why the refugee children are smiling. I'm taking a lesson from you where I'm separating the pages. There's no game we used to play with kids. You take a hand, uh, make a church. Here's the church, here's the steam. How come the people? That's the promise for this book. One earth, one people. The more I sleep, the more I dream. The more I dream, the better I pray. 
So listen to this. Here's the wall. Here's the people. No one can say it better than that. Here's the smoke rising like a church, rising like campfire, rising like kitchen fire, rising like a border that separates us from each other and blinds us town by town, pueblo by pueblo, and ranch and farm animal and farm family, each from each. The smoke that blinds us, the people who cross borders to just be with each other, to just live with each other decently. No, nobody knows this better than us. This is no border. This is the front line in a war against lines. And no one can tell us what walls we shall build between us. Walls, walls inside us, around us, behind us, in front of us. So many walls. Ridiculous. I'm surprised we ain't out all gone blind, and no one knows this better than us. Here, where the people are undivided, where the people rise up like rivers and join together with heaven to form one great river united as the sea. To eat, to laugh, to work, to prosper, to pray together, because the more we pray, the better we dream. One earth, one people. A wall which is no wall is a river that is no river at all. And we are that river, one people. Here, everywhere we go, reverential, strong, better than what anybody takes us for. And what do they know about us? What do they know about us? We flow along and we listen and we dream and nobody can stop us from doing that. Nobody, nothing, no borders, no walls. Open your hearts, open your doors. Out come the people. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. Okay. Um, so now it's story time, which means it's my turn. Maybe Carl will have a story too, I don't know. Wait, no, poetry today, okay. <laughs> I can't, you know, I don't, I don't do poetry very often. Well I'm a prose writer. So I'm going to read a chunk of a longer story that my dear husband Bruce remembered and thought fit into the theme that we're working with of Walls and Borders. Uh, and it's one of his old favorites, and so I'm going to read it. And you might want to put your minds back to um, the time when we were still using subway tokens and um, alternative rock was the rage. So uh, I'll tell you about the two main characters. I have to give you a little synopsis just so everything makes sense, right? Because we'll read you this chunk, but um, briefly. Uh, we have two characters, and one is Tina, who is an ex-call girl. She made a few wrong decisions in her life. She wanted to be a performance artist when she was in school, and she ends up getting involved in acting, and she ends up becoming a high-class call girl. This is all inspired by Heidi Fleiss, by the way, back in the day. And um, she's at a very desperate moment. She's at a time in her life when she wants to walk the straight and narrow, and she returns to her original dream, and she's trying to live it out. But since she's flat broke, and she wants to, you know, progress, and she has not a cent, and she needs to get to an audition the next day, a real moment of desperation, not even enough money for a subway token, she gets a call from her old madam offering her a really nice gig. She just has to listen to some John for the night. Just listen. Nothing else but listen to him talk. And he will pay her $5,000. But she must be sworn to secrecy. He has to have complete trust in her. And so 
she gets a call from her ex-man because her ex-man knows that this girl is someone that can be trusted. That's Tina. Danny arrives to come and talk. No sense. But he pretty bre quickly breaks his, his promise and starts to come on to her. So there's a lot of uh, friction between them. But they finally settle down and he starts to tell this very bizarre story. And I'm just going to break in with him telling the story. I'm leaving out a lot of his story, but the chunk of it that Bruce loves the most is the part that I'm going to tell. And the story is called, the, the, the whole story, it's called Abandoned City. So this is the story within the story, Abandoned City. So this is Danny. See, I always thought I didn't cause everything that happened. You make a business move, it's a catalyst. Things happen. But if you don't make a move, things happen anyway. I don't premeditate. I go on instinct. And I don't hold myself responsible for every little thing. You can't or you drive yourself crazy. God takes care of things. You just live. But now I wonder if I knew profoundly everything I was doing because I never leave loose strings in anything I do, but that one day, I didn't tell a soul where I was going or when I'd get back. And funny, that's the only reason I survived. She began to wonder if he was just one of those guys who had a circuitous style of getting off or if he was seriously crazy. I was on automatic pilot. As if I woke from a dream, I found myself in the Port Authority, a place I normally wouldn't be caught dead in. At 5 a.m. I was on a Greyhound going somewhere upstate. I didn't pay attention. Luckily, I had some money on me. Usually, I just have plastic. I got out, I don't know, a couple of hours later. It was a beautiful sunny day, one of those days in February that makes you feel like spring is on its way. I took my jacket off and started walking. There was hardly a town to speak of, one of those old country stores and a post office. I headed toward the woods. Well, there were woods on either side of the highway. And Tina says, you don't remember where this was? I have no idea, Danny said. I walked for maybe an hour. Top of my head felt warm from the sun and the air smelled so fresh and moist. I could see the sky through all these white branches and I remember thinking consciously that I never felt so free in my life. I was laughing with the birds and the chipmunks. My attachment to anything was temporarily suspended. I forgot who I was. And then out of nowhere, a little town appeared through the trees. I mean, I literally walked into someone's backyard and on through to the front across the driveway. I was a little uncomfortable because I was raised in suburbia and I know how territorial people are when they see strangers wandering aimlessly on their property. So I discreetly moved out to the street before anyone noticed me. The funny thing was, I was on a dead end, but it looked like the whole town was built in a dead end style, sort of roughly circular format. Tina says, you mean you couldn't make out a gateway into the town? I swear, I don't think there was one. I mean, it just appeared that way. It didn't come across like any roads were leading in or out. But like I said, I was in a mood to just wander and not pay much attention to where I was going. So here I was, completely seduced by this cute little place that bore a strong resemblance to the town I grew up in. And then it hit me. Everything looked old, not antiquated, fresh and new, but only very much a 50s era thing. Oh, please, he said, but he went on. I saw a few cars, I know cars, 50s or older. Tina began to go with the latter theory. Serious wacko, but he seemed harmless. Anyway, it was good material and she knew what he was going to come up with and she wanted to know what he was going to come up with for an ending. So he continued. But even at that point, no big deal, he said. A lot of these places upstate are very conservative, especially when they're off the beaten track. So I figured, okay, this is some company town that's still chugging along like a good old Chevy until it dies. I didn't see any kids playing, so that theory made sense to me. But a few minutes later, I realized that there was no sign of life anywhere. No sign of lawnmowers or dogs barking, watching me through their secret windows. Somebody was probably hiding somewhere. So I went up to one door and rang the bell, standing back at a polite distance. 
Actually, I heard a radio, a radio playing faintly through that door. It was a typical top 40 station with a cheerful sounding DJ, but no one answered. So I peeked through the screen. My God, I felt like I'd already gone through another lifetime, but the clock said only 7.30 in the morning. I could see part of a kitchen table with one of those screen printed table cloths you'd find in your aunt house. She laughed, like my Aunt Lena. It looked like a family had eaten breakfast and left the dishes and stuff on the table, he said. So I rang again. No answer. I walked on, this time crossing lawns, just looking for someone, something that moved, but nothing, not even a stray cat, disturbed the stillness of that little street. I didn't even see crows perched on telephone wires. Let me tell you, it was weird. I'm not the type to panic, but I started to sweat. I tried to reason with myself. This is just a New Yorker, not on his turf, that's all. Be cool, man, find your way out. There's nothing here for you, so move on. But for the life of me, I couldn't figure out how I came in or how to get out. I just knew if I walked far enough in a straight line, I'd hit the woods. I walked past house after pretty little house, and not a soul, not a dog in sight, maybe for 15 minutes. Finally, I saw the rim of trees that defined the edge of the woods. I had no idea where that would take me, but I figured I'd come out on some road that would lead to somewhere. By now, I was running. I practically broke my neck, tripping over a hose that was spraying a lawn as if its owner was sitting on the front porch. But the rocker was vacant, and even a basket of laundry waited there. So I gave myself another pep talk. Come on, Danny, what are you, some kind of pussy? What, you can't deal with a little piece of point? I made myself walk calmly to that porch. Why did you bother, said Tina. Just to prove to myself that I could disappear for one day and not turn it into a tragedy. I skipped up those steps like a cheerful postman. The wooden door was open. I could look right through the old brown screen. I knocked on their old brass knocker. Nothing? Nothing. But I couldn't resist anymore, so I went in. You are crazy. You could have been arrested. Everything was so still, like those places they restored in Pompeii where people were preserved in the middle of their daily activities. Only this time, I saw the dish of dog food half eaten, but no dog. I mean, there were droplets of water on the floor where he was lapping. There were cereal bowls at the kitchen table with spoons dipped in the milk. The milk pitcher had beads of sweat, and sure enough, when I touched it, it was still cold from the refrigerator. Oh, God, you must have been a nervous wreck. No. Because at that point, I knew for sure nobody was home, anywhere. I regained my composure. I figured there had to be some explanation for this, like Frank Sinatra made a surprise appearance at the county seat. But I was still curious, so I walked over to the house next door. There were lots of trees on the property, big old oak trees. In fact, the whole place had a quality of elegant neglect, like it was too much for the folks who lived there to keep it up. Well, of course, it was the same scenario. No answer, open door. I had to laugh at myself when I stepped in. There were piles of newspaper lined up by the door and only an alleyway to walk through. It was pretty dark because of the shade trees, so I flicked on a light. The old codgers use only 25 watt bulbs. In the kitchen, there were rusty bikes and tools all over the floor. There was a dress held together with pins thrown over the chair by the window and an open sewing basket on the counter. And the shelves were spilling over with all kinds of junk odd dishes and cups next to small auto parts. The kitchen had a door to the back porch and looked out on a beautiful piece of property and went straight through to the woods. So I thought, okay, I've had enough. I'll say sayonara to this whole scene with a grand exit through the enchanted garden. Then he tapped his cigarette box till one protruded and he took it directly between his lips. He held a match in the air and said, you know, before you bit my head off a while back there, I was going to add that Schick also recommended you as someone I could trust. Tina, I've never told anyone about this, and what I have to say from here on makes it imperative that you keep your mouth shut. Can you do that? Where I come from, she said, if you didn't keep your mouth shut when you were supposed to, you might become a different part of the next day's sausage. But why are you telling me this? I had to unload. I needed to talk to someone completely anonymous, yet recommended with utter confidence. And yes, I repeat, he added slowly and firmly, looking right into her eyes, someone with nothing to lose. But I see Schick made an error there. 
So, why are you taking the risk? Because I think I'm going to see you again. Oh yeah? What makes you think so? Just a hunch. Don't fuck with my head, she said. I think you better leave. And I'm going to just skip ahead a little bit. Because, you know, he comes on to her again and all that stuff, which we don't need to go into. She, want, she wants to listen to the rest of his story, and so he goes on with the story. Well, like I was saying, I had a mind to split the scene, whatever the scene was. I was going to hang on to the... Go, I'm going to hang out on the back porch for a minute and try to figure out which way to go based on the position of the sun. At this point, it was maybe 8 o'clock in the morning. As I approached the door, I saw the first sign of human habitation. What was it, she said. Smoke, he said, curling out of a pipe that was on the picnic table. Someone was there at least as long as I was. As I went to investigate, I tripped over a man's leg. Someone was there, she said. Yeah, someone was. Poor old guy. To go like that. I threw up on the spot. My God, she said, suspending disbelief. What happened to him? It looked like some kind of disease had eaten his flesh, but rapidly. He barely had any skin covering his face. I thought he was dead, or at least almost. I was pacing around frantically, trying to talk to him, looking for a phone, running back and forth. I didn't want to touch him because, you know, who knows these days? Holy shit, she said. Couldn't find a phone in that junk shop, he said. So I shouted into the old guy's face. I'm trying to help you. Where's a phone? Not a flicker out of him. But then suddenly his eyes opened. Not that they were covered with eyelids exactly, but they stared out in complete terror. He gripped my arm with his bloody hand like it was a vice, and he said, Run! You're doomed! Exposed! And I swear to you, on my mother's dead body, a bullet came out of nowhere and shot him in the head. Oh my God, what did you do? I ran my fucking ass off. What do you think? I probably should have been more careful about making a cleaner exit, but I just re re reacted on impulse, dodging behind anything in sight, trees mostly. It's a good thing I'm a runner, he said, taking a long drag. You? Well, I used to be. This whole thing's made me so nervous I'm back to two packs a day. So these bullets followed my ass right out of there and part of the way into the woods. I guess whoever it was wanted to lay low and figured they'd catch me on the other side. They were on my tail, though, but I must have dodged them because I made it to the highway with no sign of trouble. Not none that I could see anyway. I hunkered down in a rocky area to figure out my next move, and then, what do you know? An old pickup pulls up right on the side of the road in front of me, and a dude comes out to take a leak. I let him finish what he was doing and make like I'd been walking a while. Hey, man, I went up to him, thinking my best Midwest accent. You wouldn't be on your way to town now, would you? Which town, he said. Anyone with Greyhound. I've been on my feet for hours. Must have made a wrong turn for something. So he says, sure, hop in. And I make my way. I make up some funny story about getting divorced and coming up here to see my new girlfriend. But I don't know my way around here yet. And he says, I hear you, man. I know them city bitches are mighty fine, but they're so damn independent, you have to make an appointment to get laid. So I figure we're friends after that. And that's my chunk of my story. Um, thank you very much. I hope you could follow that with all the background. <laughs> Wasn't exactly a country setting. Um, okay, and so now I'm going to introduce the final reader, uh, the one and only Carl Watson. And I'm going to read his bio. Carl Watson is a poet and fiction writer. He's the author of several works of fiction, most recently only Descend from Otana Media, which is amazing, by the way. It is the third installment of a trilogy of novels, including Idols of Complicity, Sport and Devil, and Backwards, The Drown Go Dreaming, Sensitive Skin Books. Other works of fiction are Hotel of Irrevocable Acts, Otana Media, and Beneath the Empire of the Birds, at the Press. His poetry collections include Astro Botanica, Fly by Night Press, and Paradolia, Autonomia. He has written for various journals, including Village Voice, New York Press, The Williamsburg Observer, Set to the Skin, The Brooklyn Rail, Evergreen Review, De Graf, Love and Garage and others. Watson received the Kathy Acker Award for Fiction in 2012. And without further ado, the one, the 
only my hero, Carl Watson. Psychological walls and borders. So this first one is called the inconvenience of the threshold. In a hungry country, a hinge can be a terrifying sound, as translated by sight. Objects insinuate edges. Edges are never finite. Walls muster. Jams. Joints join in. Here live a people constantly threatened by doors, slamming, dicing doors, doors onto decks, thin airs, anything that swings, revolves, gates or grapes, be it cage or cross, portal or window, lips of a parting kiss even, or the lids of a judgmental eye, they cheese. Steps are minced in fear before such grand moths as these, and the most assured a citizen balks a pawn to such passing. In fact, passage is exactly what terrifies them. Even passing into the next room is like losing something. Exiting the elevated station via another thieving turnstile means bleeding a little. It's a feasting every second, and millions move to its tomb in or out of some state, one step further away from whatever it was they thought they were or wanted to be. And in that same vein, I have this other one, which is called The Totemism of Hunger. There came a time when I was seeing jaws in everything in my hand, in can openers, pruning shears, doors, window jams, everything. The animal heads of the old gods had returned to the inanimate world and I was seeing their anger effectively filling all voids, all shells. It seemed the common woodsaw even had an eye. But more important, it could know hunger. In a world such as this, it's not unusual to measure dominance by number. For instance, multiple, multiple keys spun from the belt of a sadist. For keys, too, have teeth, and when they fit like a cock in a lock and turn, it can be so, shall we say, ecstatic to know one is not imprisoned or pariah and is finally welcome home at last to many mouths. Read some poems that I wrote during the pandemic. This, this poem is called Bunker. A rag clad child arrived at his doorstep begging to be fed. Her face stained with cooking soot and gunfire powder. A movie played in the thought balloon above his head. The burning fields, the trail of corpses, the flight of dispossession. As another sovereign nation, <clears throat> nation falls to exploding population, consumers parade and despots swagger. Truth is lost to opinion. Why should he feel this refugee? Why should he feed this refugee when she'll just return again with open hand and mooring toe? with claims to house and land. So leave her to her fate, he thought, in hunger, rape, or slavery. For the armies that drove their flight, drove her flight approach from the burning ridge to poison the world's womb with hatred. 
both left and right. And who is the hero in this fight? Another individual? Another identity to defend? Another growing appetite for resources without end? There are better breeds to rebuild our Eden, so let this species finish itself in greed, he reasoned. Opening the door to the bunker, he built some birth. After all, he had many years' worth of canned excuses stored there. 100 gallons of self-righteous fuel, a privileged generator, and when the heavy metal door was closed, he could barely hear the thunder of the guns above, much less the footsteps of families fleeing their homes. It's a poem about living upstate. I have a few poems about that. It's called County Line. Sometimes Trez and I would drive through the trendier towns to the east. We'd stop to pay city-high prices for pancakes, omelets, and coffee, watching the tourists and outdoor enthusiasts, that whole crazy weekend scene of Upper North Brooklyn, people dressed in brand new flannel with yoga mats and meditation books strapped to their brand name backpacks, sporting those asymmetrical haircuts brought north by the hairdressers of Bushwick. Conquest and colonization are alive, and cool country living is one component of the well-attended market-savvy life. That said, we were always glad to be done with our visitation, and we could get out and drive back over the boundary, out where no one can get the New York Times anymore, and no one tailgates into your home in search of more art galleries or real estate locations. It's not the western counties that scare them so much, as the terrifying American class gap, which might explain why on the westbound highway at the county line, there's a wayside hygiene station for changing soil clothing. That's supposed to be fun. This is about uh, people trying to escape from your head. So I guess the wall is your skull. It's called head exit. There's a form of out-of-body experience that begins in depersonalized disassociation whereby the subject experiences their astral body crawl out the top of their head like a wet butterfly squeezing itself from the end of a worn-out cocoon. But not like a butterfly, it's not that useful. I've tried to bring on this state myself and failed. Or maybe it did happen and I wasn't actually aware. That's also possible. Often it's none of our business. I've seen it happen in bars and places of worship, gallery openings, meetings, concerts, and similar public events. Somebody will be bloviating on in rough, ridiculous conversation and maybe just bored or tired of filling the vacuum with their ego, and then it happens. Some kind of door at the top of the scalp opens up and the soul pushes itself out as if from a manhole in the street or a sewer grate. It's always a bluish gray or pinkish form of their actual body, but it's lighter, less disturbed, and it might hover there for a moment or fly around the vicinity, joining all the other free souls for a drink, a dish session, or just to ask advice. The general attitude of these escapees is this. They're not going to take our damn nonsense anymore. And the funny thing is, the person whose soul has left usually doesn't even know it. They just sit there, talking more shit and going about their life as if nothing changed, moving their mouths like fish in a dream that they can't understand, but still believing they have something to say about it. Well, that concludes our reading for the day. One more time, I'd like to thank Simon Rigg, president of the Sculpture Guild, for getting us all together with the exhibit, Walls and Borders. Chuck, 
Flixman and Ginger Andro, co-vice presidents of the Sculpture Guilds, also instrumental in the show. My husband, Bruce Weber, curator of the show and writer, Yuko Otomo, George Wallace, and Carl Watson, and I'm Joanne Pagano Weber. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming. Love having you. Thank you.